Hello and welcome to this review of Warhammer Age of Sigmar Battle Tome Night Haunts and some tokens that GW has very kindly sent me free of charge for your reviewing pleasure. Right now, normal disclaimers apply. This is a rambling review. It's not a tight clipped match play review. I don't go through the match play section and I don't go through the path to glory section. I'm just going to read it, see what's cool, and chat about it as I'm reading. So, without any further ado, my favourite bit in nearly all these books these days is the first page. It just sets the scene so nicely, so I'm, I'm taken to, to reading those out. If you hear any background purring, it's because I have a very fussy cat who is sat uh, about six inches from the microphone. And she's nearer it than I am. That's not what it says on the page. That's me describing the situation in the room. The thing I'm about to say is what it says on the page. Get on with it. It's like Monty Python. Just get on with it. <clears throat> we are the spectral host, and we cannot die. Thou cannot injure us, foolish child. Thy sword is no more threat to us than a spider's strand. Think not that we are weak for all our lack of flesh. That would cost thy life. A life that is but a heartbeat in comparison to the eternity of pain awaiting thee. Soon enough thou shalt find our grip cruel strong and our blades vicious sharp. Thou cannot torture us, not any more. We are torture eternal. Great Nagash has made it so. The very instruments of our persecution are part of us. We are bent under their weight. Thou cannot hold us back forever, not even with all thine art. Death will find its way, as thou knowest in thy soul, when the truth finds thee in the long hours of the night. We shall pass through the walls of the stoutest fortress to visit our hate upon thee. Oh, there was no escape for us at the end, nor will there be for thee or thy kin. Great Nagash has marked thee for his own. No restful afterlife awaits thee, no paradise. Instead, thou shalt be consumed by a dark Shaishan void and remade as it benefits, as it befits thy sin. What threat dost thou think to pose to us, living fool? Even thine exorcisms can banish us only for a time. Thy cursed thief god cast us back only for us to return over and over. The realms themselves, awoken, seek not to devour us. Bodiless, we give them no sustenance. The haunters of the night have long memories, child, and nothing left to cherish but hate itself. We have endured the most horrific of fates and been shaped by them, been ravaged by them. We have become death. And so we burn forever with the cold vitriol of hatred for people such as thee. We will bring thy final day and visit the chill of the grave upon thee, and thou too may feel true judgment. Look upon our ravaged souls and despair. Cool. So what have we got? Well, there's a lot of nice... There are a lot of nice pictures. I've just been saying this about the Daughters of Cain one, uh, but they've really done some very nice set pieces with the models in these books. Um, Lady Orlando, the Mortark of Grief. Ah, mm, so cool. It does make me want to paint my night haunts. Okay, so what do we have? Well, the, the narrative is... I won't really go into what the narrative actually is. I'm just saying what you can expect from reading the book. So, this tells you all about who the Night Haunts are. The very short version is they are um, so people who were punished in life also being punished in death. Um, in a way that um, is similar to, uh, to their crime. Um some nice artwork with various ghasts and geists flying across uh, this image some kind of 
underground thingy, but just sort of faint in and amongst the, the very clear images in the distance there are, there are really faint things, sort of um, really ethereal um, and just like there's the suggestion here of a of like a, a sort of toothed maw not oh, cool um, then we've got a section the nature of the damned uh, I'll read this the intro uh, the night haunter fashions from Shaish and spirit to the heart-stopping monstrosities and inspire terror in Nagash's foes. It is their role to act as the swift-moving vanguard of the great necromancer's forces, preparing the way for his ultimate ascendancy by striking deep fear into those cultures that oppose him. The fear they bring comes as thick as thick in the chill air, like frost on the soul. It is their greatest weapon. Um... Yeah, it, it talks about um, the nature of fear and weakness and strength. So there's a, the, it, it talk. One of the difficulties from a narrative perspective is that if you're giving the night haunts um, an unmodifiable save. And saying basically they're ethereal, the soul passes straight through them, so it doesn't matter how much you rend and you just go straight through. Then how do you explain the fifty percent of the time that it does kill them? Because um, you could, because back in the day it would be affected by magical weapons only, would be the four of the fantasy battle um, equivalent. So you can you either do nothing or normal if you've got a magical weapon. Um, The way they've treated it here is it's nothing to do with the nature of the weapon that wounds the um, that wounds the night haunt. It's the fear or courage and the belief in the soul of the person swinging it. If their faith in their god or their faith in their own strength or their faith in whatever is strong, that courage, that bravery, it sort of banishes the despair and the act of of that sort of defiance uh, is what disrupts the night haunt, not the actual weapon itself. Uh, but if they if they have fear in their soul, if they if they're despairing, then that's when their weapons do nothing to. Them. Which on first hearing, yeah, that's cool. I like that, and that works if you've got if you're playing against. Army uh, cities of Sigma, for instance, normal, normal mortals, stormcasts. Fifty percent of the time, the stormcast weapons do no damage because they're scared. Daughters of Cain, they fear very little. They really do. Um, <laughs> and you could go around half the armies, and some of them you go, yep, yeah, kind of works for them, and others you go. Ugh. I'm not sure that works. Um, I mean, you could say with Stormcast Eternals, it's the fact that the weapons uh, are zerite. But yeah, okay. So they, they sometimes work, they sometimes don't. Um, or they work a bit, which is why on average that comes down to 50% success. That's not what it says. Anyway. Um, yes, and a big thing about how the reason why Lady Olinda is the Mortark of Grief is because she fundamentally understands um, the the nature of um, mortal dread and the, the weapon that it is. Um, yep. Then there's a bit about uh, Shaiish itself and um, the fact that it was almost conquered by chaos. Then the haunted empire, Shaiish itself, uh, and the various areas in it: uh, Nagashazar, Shade Spire, Necropolis of Cartouche, Lethis, which is still a, a, a Sigmarite metropolis. Uh, yeah, and it's in a nice sort of purple shade and hue.
Then the obligatory mini stories from the Age of Myth, the Age of Chaos, and the Age of Sigma. Obviously, there are things in here about the Soul Wars and the <coughs> the Necroquake. And they started referring to Sigma. This may have been done previously, and I just never noticed it. But as the Soul Thief, which I quite, I quite like, because you know it's totally true. Sorry, thirsty. Um, there's quite a few more of these than uh, in other books. There's a bit of a mind to tap there of things to read. I obviously I haven't. I guess so many books. I don't have to. I don't get to read them all cover to cover in enough time to do the review. I have to select, be selective with what I go into in detail. But. Um, yeah, nice bit here. The gathering of rates about the the military organization and uh, say military, the the host organization. So you've got uh, the shroud guard are the sort of generals that um, you've sort of you, the nighthorn. You've got Lady Olander, the Mortar of Grief at the top, obviously, with things like. Ulrak, the Drowner, and the Script of Mortis just being sort of off to one side, sort of uh, close lieutenants. Then you've got Kurdos Valentian, the Craven King, is a, is almost on a par with Lady Yolanda, but subservient to him. And uh, his Craven Throne Guard. Then this then but leads into the Shroud Guard, which are your Knights of Shrouds and your Blade Gre Geist Revenants, who then command the individual hosts that come underneath those the death riders which are dread blade harrows hex wraiths black coaches the condemned spirit torments chain ghasts chain rasps cruel ghasts cruciators um the chain guard guardian of souls and chain rasps execution hordes lord executioners and spirit hosts death stalkers Cairn Wraiths, Grimgast Reapers, Glaive Wraith Stalkers, Shrieker Hosts, Tomb Banshees, Dread Scythe Harridans, Myrmidon Banshees. Very thematic. Very thematic. And whilst at the moment I haven't got a large range painted, when I have, I can easily see myself you know, looking at this going, and I think we'll have a Chain Guard in this army. Dink, Guardian of Souls, Chain Rasps. And a Shrieker host. Two Banshees, Harridans, Myrmidon. Done. Oh no, hang on. Shroud Guard, Blake Ash Revenants. There we go. They, they write themselves. They really do. Their army list. Now, what we do have for, I believe, the first time, we have the various different hosts. Um, so, sub factions. Um. The implication being they haven't all they aren't all hosts that started in Shaish, but some of them are in different places. Um, the Grieving Legion is your typical um, dark shroud, blue arms, uh, the the royal court of uh, Doldrum. Um, The vast majority of all your special characters are the Grieving Legion. You've then got the Emerald Host. Uh, are these supposedly from the Realm of Life? Well, riding upon the storm of green white energy, the cavaliers of the Emerald Host cry out in harsh voices as they close in on their foe. They're just different hosts. The Scarlet Doom. Oceans of blood have been spilled throughout the ages, and often purely for the sake of cruelty. It is not only the spirit of the gore-soaked land that remembers those atrocities, nor only the sights of these massacres that still echo to the howls of the slain. So, sort of, some of the ones that have died in different ways are drawn together and formed. There's sort of an echo of 
of, uh, of various past atrocities. And that's quite obvious in the Quicksilver Dead, which is the last one, uh, is um, a, a Chamon um, inkling um, sliding through the air like shimmering snakes come the Quicksilver Dead, a host of silvered spirits, each intent on perfecting the craft of death. Each sword blow levelled against them splashes right through their liquid metal bodies, their essences reforming almost instantly behind the blade before the killing riposte bites deep. The magic of Chamon lies heavy upon the Quicksilver Dead. Yes, yeah, realm of metal. Ghosts in the realm of metal. I made it ghosts. Be quite an interesting modelling project. A painting project, that. Getting the... That's quite a, probably quite a quick... Um, Time to table. Spray them in lab botcher. Ink them in known. Ton of dry brushing. Highlights. Done. Then we got some blurb on Nagash and Lady Hollander, as you would expect. Then the um, and I really like in these particular in the the current crop of battle tomes. Um, and, and no, less so in, I was going to say also in Codices for 40k, but no, it's mostly in Battle Tomes. Um, we've got a nice little section on each of the characters and each of the unit types, just telling you what their shtick is, who they are, where they've come from. So, um, Relicor the Grimhaler once was a sorcerer king adept in the ways of Shaishan magic. He learned more of Death's Eldritch secrets than a man ever should. Uh, and maintained his knowledge of necromancy was near to that of Nagash himself. Uh oh. Old the Drowner. Half heard cries haunt the cusp of hearing as Old glides from the fog. At first they are mistaken for the plaintive cawing of seabirds, whereas he drifts closer, words can be picked out. Help, help. These are the last desperate utterances of those he sent to a briny death under the guise of a trusted ferryman each entreaty dwindling to a gurgling sob before being replaced by new voices and new voices again. So there's just so much cool in here, so much good. This is what these things are about. Cruel cast cruciators, knight of shrouds, dreadblade harrows, hex wraiths. You know, you want to know what the unit is, what its thing is, why it does what it does, where it comes from. It's all here. Uh, and then we've got a nice double page spread here with six units on it. So doing you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, and a nice bit of artwork for each one. And we've got same sort of thing. Uh, tomb Banshees, Cairn Wraiths, Guardians of Souls, Lord Executioners, Chain Ghasts, and Spirit Torments. Then it comes into some of the uh, same sort of thing, but for... Uh, other unit types, Scripta Mortis, Glaive Race Stalkers, Grim Gast Reapers, Chain Rasp, Spirit Host, Blade Geist Revenants, Miramorn Banshees, Dread Scythe Harridans, you get the gist, they're all explained to my satisfaction. Then we've got some more nice little um, set pieces with minis, we're into the, we're into the picks now, Lady Hollander, uh, Kordos Valentine, Alrak the Drowner. I can't decide whether I like Alrak or not. Oh yes, I can. I've just seen his oar is swim is paddling through spirits. <coughs> That's just sold it for me. Uh, we've got some examples of different spirit hosts. So, um, Quicksilver Dead. This guy. This is all the etherealness is metal on this guy. The Emerald Host, the Revenant, the sort of spirity wisps are in, I've got that green tinge to them rather than the bluey one. Uh, Scarlet Doom, the uh, Blade Guys Revenant, it's all red and shiny. Like it's, it looks like a dark cow that's just been soaked in blood. Not that I have an exact frame of reference for what that looks like, but it gives me that impression. Very cool. Lovely, I 
I say little huge diorama here against um, uh, the Hammers of Sigma. Mm, that's cool. Then the painting guide, we've got um, different techniques for various things. So there's the blue spirit technique, which is, um, you guys know about Corax White and Nighthawk Gloom and Iron Rack Skin and Deep Kin Flesh. Then the green spirit talks about Corax White, Hex Wraith Flame, Longbeard Grey, and other, yeah, it's how to do the different types of spirit. How to paint rusted metal, verdigreed brass, different variants of cloth. So there's a Rhinox Hide variant, a Skaven Blight, Dunge variant, an Abaddon Black variant, which is sort of sort of blue highlights, I want to say. A whole bunch of different variants, which is nice. Same with weapons. Um, bloodied blades, corroded blades, green ethereal blades, balefire candles... Lantern Glow. Yeah, it's all good stuff. Right, we're now into the rules. So, Battle Traits. Now, this is where I do have a bit of a frame of reference because I have played some games with them in 3rd Ed AOS with the previous Battle Tome. There's stuff that's similar and there's stuff that has changed altogether. Oh conceptually stayed the same but changed in the way it's delivered so nighthawk processions yes you get to choose either grieving Ho grieving legion emerald host scarlet doom or quicksilver dead and i'll go on to those when we get to them in the book um aura of dread um enemy units that are within three inches of a nighthawk unit are terrified which means they cannot issue or receive the inspiring presence command. So you can't spend, you can't throw command points at the problem and make your unit stay, which is nice. Ethereal now does a couple of things. Um, friendly knight or to have a ward save of six. So previously you had to be within range of a character to have a hero to get the range uh, to get the ward save of six up. Uh, I've seen this in a couple of uh, various different books. Um, it seems like they're just going for the, you know what, let's just make life simpler and just give them the ward save. It appears to be where they go. Excuse me. Um, friendly night hunt units can retreat and charge in the same turn. Nice. And as per before, they ignore modifiers, both positive and negative, to save rolls. Uh Discorporate uh, is a command ability that you can use uh, when a unit is targeted. The unit has a ward save of 5 plus instead of 6 plus. Um, given the order, the night haunt can flicker between the realms of the living and the dead. I like that. That's sort of like your all out defense equivalent, but not on the save. Right, Wave of Terror. Now, previously, this used to be, if you rolled, I think it was a 10 or more to charge. It might have been 11 or more to charge. You got to fight immediately and then again in the fight phase. That's gone. What it is now is when you've charged, you pick an enemy unit that's within one inch, uh, and you compare the charge roll to a table. And then, depending on what you've rolled, you apply an effect to the enemy unit. So, and that's what these tokens are for. Because this will get... If you're doing three, four, five charges in a turn, the admin of this will be ridiculous without tokens. So, you've got tokens to represent the different uh, wave of terror effects. So, if you've got a four to six, uh, the, they are shrieking which means the unit that you've shrieked at is at minus one to hit in the combat phase, so you put a shriek token on it, which also says minus one to hit on it. Uh, eight or nine, they are stunned, and minus one from their save rot throws in the following combat phase, so they can't move as quickly, they're being shivved up more good and proper. Stun tokens with minus one save written on them, 10 or more, they are petrified. Uh, they gain the 
fight's last effect in the following command phase. Again, token, petrify. Now, you can choose to apply one of the lesser results uh, if you roll a higher one. So, if you've rolled 10 plus for petrify, you could choose instead to make them stunned because petrify is higher on the table, so you could go, actually, they're not going to be petrified, they're going to be stunned. Because stunned is minus one from saving throw, so you might have a tough nut you're trying to crack open uh, with a three plus or a two plus save that can then all out defend. So you want to uh, make them, a, you know, you want the can opener of them being stunned by your wave of terror. But it does all depend on the charge roll. Uh, four to seven being shriek. So if you roll a three to charge, you get nothing. Because you could, if you have to be more than three inches away and you've got to finish within half an inch, you could be more than three inches away and roll a three and then be in. So yes, nothing if you roll a three. Right, two more battle traits. Frightful touch. If the unmodified hit roll for an attack made by a friendly night haunt is a six, the attack wounds the target automatically. Do not make a wound roll. So it's not a mortal wound, so it doesn't bypass their save, but it does um, it does wound them automatically. I'm not quite sure. All the others make perfect sense and seem to work. That one feels a little bit unnecessary to me, a bit, a bit OTT. Don't know, haven't played them yet, but. And then Vanishing Phantasms. So before you had a rule where you could uh, keep, for every unit you deployed, you could keep one in reserve. From what I've seen, that's fairly common in the second dead battle terms. This now basically says, uh, at the end of deployment, before you determine who controls objectives, you can take up to three units off the board and then put them into reserve. So you can't put some chain rasps on an objective and then go, oh no, they're vanishing phantasms, but I control the objective. So you take them off before um, you determine who controls the stuff. Okay, so command traits. Shades of death and night haunt hero only. Lingering spirit has a ward save of four plus versus mortal wounds. Terrifying Entity. Enemy units are terrified if they are within six inches of this general. Uh, for the purposes of the Dread Aura. The Aura of Dread battle trait. Only affects inspiring presence. I don't know. Oh, well, who knows. That might be having a significant effect. Uh, ruler of the Spectral Hosts. Once per battle at the end of the movement phase. Pick a summonable unit that's been destroyed. On a 4 plus, a new replacement unit with half the models is added back to your army within 12 inches of the general. Hatred for the living. Reroll hit and wound rolls for melee weapons that target enemy units that do not have the death keyword. Oh. <laughs> Spiteful spirit. At the end of the combat phase. Uh. If the general takes wounds that were not negated, roll a number of dice equal to the wound characteristic of the general. For every four plus, each enemy unit within six inches suffers one mortal wounds. This geist's bitter resentment of its cruel existence is palpable and could be channeled into a vengeful curse to punish those who would do it harm. <laughs> They're all good. They're all good. Cloaked in shadow. The general cannot be picked as a target for a shooting or combat attack by more than one unit per phase. Interesting. Right, artifacts of power. There's a few different ones of these. Uh, Relics of the Underworld, Night Haunt Hero only. Cloak of the Waxing Moon. Uh, subtract one from the attack characteristic of melee weapons that target the bearer. Pendant of the Fell Wind. Subtract one from wound rolls for attacks made by melee weapons if they're within three inches of the bearer. Midnight Tome. Wizard only. Once per battle. 
The bear attempts to cast a spell that would summon an endless spell. It automatically casts with a casting roll of 12 and can not be unbound. That's nice. Weapons of the Damned. Night Haunt Hero only. Shadow's Edge. Pick one of the bearer's weapons. Unmodified hit roll. Wound roll is 6. The attack is... Uh, does D3 mortal wounds and the sequence ends. Reaper of Sorrows. Pick one of the bearer's weapons. Before the bearer attacks, pick an enemy unit within 2D6 inch, within an inch. Roll 2D6. If it's higher than the bravery, the rend characteristic becomes minus 3. If the unit is terrified, it becomes minus 4. Slitter. When you pick the bearer to fight for the first time in a turn, before the bearer makes a pile of move, you can pick one enemy model within an inch and roll the dice. If the roll is greater than the model's wound characteristic, the model is slain. The description for this is nice. Forged from the shivs and cutthroat razors of a thousand serial killers, the dagger is murder made manifest. So you just get a random free stab at a nearby model, and if you roll higher than its wound characteristic, it's dead. I mean, that might be the enemy general. So, okay, oh, I need a six. <laughs> hey, strange things have happened. Right, Infernal Treasures. The Light Shard of the Harvest Moon. This uh, lets you, once per battle, add one to the attack characteristic of melee weapons with the units within 12 inches. The Beacon of Nagashizar, once per battle, uh, return one slain model to each summonable unit on the battlefield. Soul Firing, at the end of the combat phase you can heal up to d6 wounds allocated to the bearer. Covetous Familiar. Units that finish a pile and move with three inches suffer a mortal wound after they pile in. The spiteful poltergeist squirt swirls around its master's essence, lashing out at any other soul that draws too near. <laughs> That's cool. It's like a vicious little goblin. Get away! Uh, Witch Light Lantern. Once per battle, the wizard could attempt to cast an extra spell. It does not know from the law of the underworlds can attempt to cast so it's a bit of utilitarian something you um something you might want that you know you haven't taken okay speaking of which the law of the underworlds nagash and night haunt hero wizard only including unique units only Soul Cage. Pick an enemy immediately within 12 inches. They fight last. Spirit Drain. Enemy unit within 18 inches. Roll a number of dice equal to the number of models. For each six, the unit suffers a mortal wound. Cashier number three, please. Life Stealer. 12 inches. One enemy unit. Suffers D3 mortal wounds. You can heal a wound for each mortal wound that was allocated and not negated by the spell. Seal of Shaish, very similar to the Sea Lion of Shaish, but with a differing number of ears. Uh, pick a friendly night one unit within 12 inches. Uh, the unit has a ward save of 5 plus to your next hero phase. Shade Mist, 12 inches. Pick a friendly unit, subtract 1 from wound rolls to them. Spectral Tether. Remove the caster from the battlefield or set it up on the battlefield more than nine inches away from enemy units. Cannot move in the following movement phase. Very handy at repositioning. Now there used to be a general... I remember now. There used to be a, um, a generic command... Uh, not command trait. Command ability. That the general could use to lift a unit off the board and summon it to him. That's not here anymore. I guess it might be in an individual. 
on an individual, not data slate, war scroll. Uh, but it's not a generic army thing anymore. Okay. Now we come to the processions. So the sub faction rules. Hang on to your seats, it could be a bumpy ride. The Grieving Legion. Now this sounds nice at first, but I'm not sure of the efficacy of it. Um dragged into the grave. Enemy units cannot retreat that whilst they are within three inches of any Grieving Legion unit with ten or more models. Now most of the Grieving Legion units come in multiples of ten. Most of the Night Hunt units come in multiples of ten, five or ten. Um so if you want to be able to do this with any confidence, i.e. not having just lost one model in the combat and gone down to nine or eight or seven, you're going to need reinforced units, which is probably just big units of chain rasps. It's all right. Maybe there's just something I'm not seeing. The Emerald Host. The Emerald Curse. After the armies have been set up, before the first battle round begins, you can pick up to D3 plus 1 at different enemy units in the battlefield. At the end of each battle round, roll the dice for each unit you picked. On a 2 plus, it suffers D3 mortal wounds. If the units are monsters, suffer D3 plus 1 instead. What's the description of this? When Lady Olander seeks the utter annihilation of a foe, she will inflict upon them the dread emerald curse. Forth from the citadel of Doldrum will ride the emerald host, a force of night haunts whose sole purpose is to enact ghastly retribution and who will not cease until the lady's nemesis has been destroyed. Hmm. Okay, the Scarlet Doom. Vortex of Frenzied Violence. <laughs> After friendly blade guys revenants make a charge move, pick an enemy unit with an inch. Roll the number of dice equal to the number of models from the charging unit. For each five plus, the target suffers one mortal wound. So go big on blade guys revenants, charge stuff, do mortal wounds to them. The quicksilver dead, artisans of harrowing death. Ward rolls cannot be made for wounds caused by attacks made with melee weapons from friendly Dreadscythe Harridan units. You can't ward save, save against Dreadscythe Harridans. I guess that's situational. Not all armies will have ward saves. Uh, the Grand Forge, Forge Cities of Elixir. If I remember rightly was it in the mortal world realms anthology or was it in the realm gate wars i think it was in the realm gate wars there was a story about a um a master smith uh who was being courted by uh the chaos general who just rolled over their lands and the smith refused to marry him so he killed her by dunking her in metal and then um made a statue out of the corpse with the metal around it and later she was raised as um as a sort of metal geist that's got to be what these are based off yeah very cool very cool it's a really good story Right, Path to Glory, Path to Glory. Match play, no thank you. Right. Now we're on to profiles and points. I mean, Nagash. How many points is Nagash now? In here. I'll just look for the one that's four figures. Oh, not quite. He's only 955 points. The 955, the extra 5 makes a lot of difference. Um, I mean, what to even say? 16 wounds, 3 plus save, 9 each move. Uh, he can attempt to cast 3 spells. Um, he knows all of the spells in... He can be, he can go, he can join Night Haunts, Fleshy Succorts, 
caught bone reapers or soul blights. He knows all the spells of whichever army he's in. And the, the nine books of Nagash let him cast an extra five spells. It does degrade down to one spell, but it's an extra five. So he can cast eight spells. The Staff of Power gives him plus three to cast, which also degrades, but starts off at plus three. So he knows he's got, what, one, two on his, date, on his war scroll. And he knows all six, plus Mystic Shield, which will be relevant for some of the armies he's in, and Arcane Bolt. And, yeah, okay, casting value of eight, casting value of six. Well, you're getting plus three to the roll, so you've got a minimum of minimum value of five when you roll the dice if he's on full health. Invocation of the gash. Start your hero phase. Pick five different friendly summonable units. Each one regains D3 wounds or equivalent slain models. Has a ward save of, six, of four plus. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the gash, isn't it? Well, it's, a, it's the slightest fragment of his consciousness. The slightest. A little bit like uh, a little bit like a little metal hook that's been broken off in a battered police car that some kid throws back out of the of the car and then the metal robot walks up and the little bit of hook just melts and goes bloop back into his foot. Lady Ollander, the Mortark of Grief. Uh, so, Staff of Midnight, four attacks, three plus three plus minus two, two. The spectral claws of her uh, attendants, six attacks, four, four, minus one, one. But she has got some nice... I mean, she's got two... She's a wizard, two spells. Ward save of four plus. Once per battle, um, start the hero phase. She can return up to D6 slain models to each friendly night haunt unit on the battlefield. Roll separately for each unit. No rest for the wicked. She's the Mortark of Grief. Oh, and she has a rule called the Mortark of Grief. Roll a dice each time an enemy unit issues a command within 12 inches. On a 5 plus, the command is not received, but still counts as having been used, and the command point is lost. Chosen by Nagash to serve as his Mortark of Grief, Lady Ollander's very presence serves as a psychological weapon of terrible potency. Nah. Lifting the Veil. At the start of your shooting phase, you can pick one enemy unit within 12 inches and roll a dice. On a 2+, plus, it suffers a number of mortal wounds equal to the roll. Add one to the number if it's terrified. Ah, so there are some rules in here that build on the terrified thing. If any enemy models are slain by this ability, you can heal up to D3 wounds. Allocated to this unit for each enemy model that was slain. He's only got seven wounds. So if you've got it down to one wound, then at the start of the shooting phase, she just looks at you within 12 inches and... Yeah, gets gets a lot better. Oh, I suppose it depends how many wounds that they've got. If you've got one wound models, then you're going to get two, three, four. She's going she's gonna to be fine. Grief Stricken is a spell. Pick an enemy unit, minus one from hit rolls, and add one to hit rolls for units targeting it. So they're very sad. They don't hit as well, and they get clobbered much more easily. Good old Lady Hollander. Note to self, paint her. I've got most of my night haunts are built and paint, uh, undercoated, ready to use. Kurdos Valentinian. Uh, he's more of a fighty person, really. Uh, he's got some spectral uh, companions as well, but his, sepul his sepul sepulchral scepter, sepulchral scepter, five attacks, three plus, three plus, minus three, three. He is a beast. At the start of the battle round, ah, so. That his rule, if is if I cannot rule, none shall rule. 
basically gives you a chance of stealing your opponent's command points at the start of the turn, which I like. And a 5 plus. Yoink! <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. All rack the Drowner. Uh, the Death Wood Orb, three inch range, four attacks, minus three. Th uh, sorry, three plus three plus minus two, D3. What can you do? Passage through the Underworld. Oh, this is a mechanic that lets you redeploy Night Haunt units. Um, it's a command ability, though, so it costs you command points. And it. And it counts as their movement. Then there's a mechanic for doing mortal wounds as he drives his boat into people. Oh, I want to go and paint all these now. Raikonor the Grim Hailer. The guy foolish enough to say, I know as much as Nagash. Nagash he doesn't take kindly to that kind of stuff. He's very touchy. Um, moderate attackiness. Fell Reaper. Five attacks. Three plus three plus minus two, two. Corpse Candles. These are very nice. In the hero phase, before he attempts to cast a spell, you can sn he can snuff out a corpse candle. Which means he can either do a mortal wound to an enemy model, enemy unit within 12 inches, or to a friendly unit. If he does it to a friend, an enemy unit, he gets to add one to his casting roll. If he does it to a friendly, he gets to add three to his casting roll. So, uh, draining the essence of uh, of one of his minions is apparently much more effective than stealing it from someone else. Grim Justice. Uh, oh, he's a wizard. I forgot to mention that. Add one to hit and wound rolls for attacks made with this unit's fell reaper if the target is a priest or a wizard. I didn't like priests and wizards. And his spell, Wraith Storm, uh, is a mortal wound output. P up D3, if you kill any units, another D3. Script and Mortis. So. <sighs> He's a little bit complicated. He's not very good in a fight. Uh, he has a method of um, passing off mortal wounds to nearby units, but his main thing is in his hero phase he can judge an enemy soul. He's writing down the uh, he's writing their story because these guys were historians who uh, gave what they considered to be an historically accurate rendition of things that had happened in the past. Nagash is in it to be biased in favour of Sigma, so he's got them rewriting it all in their death. And any time they write anything he doesn't like, he comes along and slaps them and they have to start again. But what it can they can do is they can write the end of someone's life nearby and it starts to become it starts to play out and become real. Um So, long story short, you pick an enemy model to judge. Then the next turn, you make a judgment roll. Uh, and if the roll is less than the number of the current battle round, the judge soul tough suffers 2d6 mortal wounds. So, basically, as the game goes on, it is more and more likely that they're just their life essence is going to be snuffed out as per the story that the Script of Mortis has written down. But obviously, the Script of Mortis just must be on the table for that to happen. So he goes, I judge your Lord Relictor. And he goes, let's kill that thing very fast. Because I can feel a twitching in my soul. Um, Knight of Shrouds. Uh, there's one on the on Ethereal Steed, one not. Um, they both get a sword of stolen hours. Five attacks, three plus three plus minus one, two. Quite nice. Uh, every time you slay a model with a sword of stolen hours, you heal a wound and add one to your wound characteristic. 
Sorry, not every time. Every phase in which you have done that. Um, even so, you could end up building up quite a few wounds, depending on the game. Um, so, the one on foot has got the Spectral Overseer um, ability. Uh, okay, so Spectral Overseer and Lord... Hmm, I'll do one at a time, Paul. Uh, basically, once per battle round, he can issue, redeploy, or unleash hell without spending a command point. Then, in the command phase, you can double bubble him with another unit, with a, a Night Hunt summonable unit, to say, right, he's going to attack, and then they're going to attack before your opponent gets to go. The Knight on the Steed does that as well, except, except for doing the redeploy or unleash hell, uh, he gets to issue all out attack. I guess that makes sense because we'll be charging on a. Du -du -du. Um, Dreadblade Harrow. I'm not going to go into all the details, but one thing that is quite interesting Curse of Loyalty. Once per battle round, if your general issues a command, this unit can issue the same command in the same phase without the command point being spent. So if you've got a couple of these running around the battlefield and you go all out attack on. The general goes all out attack on this unit. Then they cast, they uh, play it as well. Nice. Uh, Lord Executioner. Nothing particularly to report there. Guardian of Souls looks remarkably similar to uh, the last time I saw it. Uh, Nightmare Lantern adds plus one to wound rolls for nearby night haunt units. Spectral Law heals. Wounds. Spirit Torment and the Chain Ghasts have changed a bit. I did cover this in the unboxing of the new box for so I'm not going to go into these in a lot of detail. The short version is, previously, the Chain Ghasts needed to be near the Spirit of Torment and just effectively um, threw out the Spirit of Torment's aura further. doesn't do that now. Uh, it's got a different ability and the Spirit of Torment just has to be on the battlefield for the Chain Gas to be able to do it. Tomb Banshee. Uh, she's still got the Piercing Scream, which is, you know, it's fine. The Chill Dagger is it's two attacks, three plus three plus minus two, two, so it's not terrible, but it's not fantastic. If it was five attacks, it'd be pretty good. Um, by no means any kind of complaint. Um, has a has an interesting effect. The ghostly howl. Um, you can only use it in your turn because it's the end of your charge phase. But basically, you can pick a unit within twelve inches, enemy unit, and on a four plus, then issuing them command points costs double sorry one extra so double can rates o m g i'm totally painting my my can wraith well actually i have a can wraith that's posing as um uh, a revenant a, another unit because i was a model short and they had sides and i thought he looks similar enough i'll paint him the same mm, tweaking him so um <laughs> is Kernock Scythe range 2 inches attacks special 3 plus 3 plus minus 1 2 nothing 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 like rain no 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 it's all right the attack characteristic of the unit's Kernock Scythe is equal to the number of enemy models within 3 inches of this unit when the attack is made Not wholly within, just within. So you charge this into a horde unit, you get within six, seven models, three inches. Three inches is a lot of radius. And that's not even if, I mean, in subsequent terms, if they swarm around him, I mean, you could wipe out the whole unit in one swing of the side. But even when you're charging in, it's still going to be potentially six, seven, eight models. And it's damaged two weapon. 
So chances are you'll kill half the model. I mean, it's no it's no good if you're going up against one unit. But as a whole, against a, a, a one model unit. But against big units, that is so tasty. Uh, Grimgast Reapers, one of the main changes here is they've got rid of the mechanic for the death knell with the mortal wound thingy. I don't think it added anything. It's now a unit champion with a different weapon that just does D3 damage instead. That's much more elegant. Uh, chain Rasps haven't really changed from what I can see. I can't remember if they had this before or not. Um, oh, okay, a couple of things have changed. So I can't remember if they had this before or not, but uh, they get add one plus one to wound rolls. Uh, if they charge, I don't think they had that before. Actually, I thought think before it was a they get something if they've got twenty or more models. So I don't think that they had that. The champion, the dread, these used to have a low bravery, and the dread warden made. I think they had like a bravery of five, and the dread warden gave them plus three, taking the bravery to eight. Well, the bravery's just eight now. Uh, the dread warden gets an extra attack. Blade Geist Revenants and Craven Throne Guard. I went through in the unboxing of that video. They haven't changed. They have lost. The Blade Geist have lost a couple of buffs from the previous uh, book, but they were the they were the things that tied them into the Spirit of Torments. So I think it kind of makes sense. Craven Throne Guard. I'm interested to see how they play. Because it's that 12 inch range on the crossbows, and I'm just not sure what they're going to do. There's one way to find out. Uh, Glaive Wraith Stalkers, they've done a nice little thing with here. Um, they. So they used to have this. So that from a narrative point of view, the Glaive Wraith Spear points at the heart of their next victim. And they had something fairly. Yeah. About, um, to represent that what they have now I really like this at the start of your first hero phase pick an enemy unit to be its prey after this unit has moved if it finishes its move closer to its prey then you get an extra 3 inches on your charge roll how good is that and then I can't remember the attack profile before, but now it's 1, 4 plus, 3 plus, minus 1, 2. I don't think... I think the rend and the damage is new, so I think they've been they've been buffed a little bit. They're a little bit more special. The, they felt... There were a number of units in the book before that felt like they were all pretty samey, but now there are, they've varied things a bit, so they, there is some variation. Uh, spirit Hosts... Um, they used to hit on fives, and then on sixes they did went straight to mortal wounds. Now it's just six attacks, fours, fours, dash, one. Um, and there's a mechanic which uses far too many words to say that on a three plus they can take wounds for nearby heroes. Um, the Mermorn Banshees, nothing... The thing to call out is they have the spell eater rule, which basically uh, is an unbind of a spell within 12 inches. However, it's after unbinding has already occurred. So your wizard tries to unbind it, and if it still gets through, the mermaid banshees will potentially eat it using a very similar mechanic to unbinding. Uh, the Dread South Harridans. Um, I think they have changed, but I can't remember what they were because I haven't used them before. The Scythe Limbs are now four attacks, four plus four plus dash one, which I do think is different. However, uh, Murderous Bloodlust. If when they attack, they are within six inches of an of enemy models that have wounds allocated to them, or any units that have had models slain that turn, 
then they get plus one to hit and plus one to wound. Murderous Bloodlust. So you just got to make sure you do some damage to a unit before you uh, send these in and they just go crazy. Which I think is really cool. The Black Coach is much more utilitarian. Uh, is mu Before, it, I couldn't, I didn't get it. Um, now, um, the weapons all kind of make sense. You've got eight attacks from Hooves and Teeth, nine from Spectral Claws, the Reaper Scythe, which is the Wraith uh, Driver? Pilot? Uh, it's four attacks, minus two, two damage. Um, it has a mechanic that lets it do mortal wounds. Um, it has a mechanic that lets you redeploy it on the battlefield, Nimbus of Power, instead of making a normal move or a retreat, so it can travel through the underworlds. Uh, and it has the Evocation of Death rule, which is a bit clunky, but um, when you set it up for the first time, put a dice beside the model. Every time an enemy model dies or flees within 12 inches, increase the value of the dice by 1 to a maximum of 6. If the value of the dice is 5 or 6, the unit has a ward save of 4 plus instead of 5 plus. Um... Once per turn in your shooting phase, if the value of the dice beside the unit is 6, you can say the unit will unleash its stored necromantic energy. If you do, pick an enemy unit within 12. On a 2+, plus, that unit takes 3 D3 mortal wounds. Then change the value of the dice back to 1. So, basically, you drive it into things and kill stuff. Then your dice, for every model that gets killed... It goes up to, uh, it gains a point. When it gets to six, in the shooting phase, you can just let it all out. 3d3 mortal wounds. I need to start assembling mine. Uh, the Briar Queen and the Thorns of the Briar Queen. Um, the main thing to mention here is... And I don't know if this is true with some of the other books, because I tend to skip over these. But because I've got these for Underworlds, I've paid a little bit more attention to them. The thorn, because I, when I was building my Night Hunt army, I looked at, at whether or not it was a practical thing to include in the army as I was building, and I concluded it wasn't. However, the Thorns of the Briar Queen, which is a model of a unit of six models, which is uh, uh, Varak the sort of Varkal the Cruel the Ever Hanged and Four Chain Rasps. Um, they have a wounds characteristic of two. So whilst it's only six models, it's 12 wounds, which makes it a usable unit. Okay, it's five plus save. They also have a base of three attacks each. So it's got 18 attacks. The Briar Queen has got some nice little abilities. So, I mean, she's got a shooting attack, which is a minus three rend. That's only one damage, but... Um, she's also a wizard and there aren't that many wizards in the book so she's an option I think she's practical and not so fiddly anymore as she was before and the thorns you can move her around with the thorns of the Briar Queen and not feel like um, it's just pointless that it's so small it's just it's, it's a nothing Okay, Hex Wraiths. I was hoping for something kind of big and different because I've had trouble with my Hex Wraiths. I can't get my head around them. Uh, they're all right. So, two wounds, four plus save. Uh, the Spectral Scythe is two attacks each, three plus three plus minus one, one damage. Um, hooves and teeth are two, four plus four plus. Phantasmal Advance. At the start of your movement phase, you can perform Phantasmal Advance. You can't charge in the turn. You do so, but you double the movement. So you can move them 24 inches, which is nice. So they're definitely a manoeuvring unit. Um, when it makes a charge move, it can do D3 Mortal Wounds on the charge. 
So I think if you're wanting these to do anything, you probably need a unit of 10. You need to have a couple of ridey characters going with them. But they can move. They can move. And they're going to need something with them to keep them patched up as they take casualties. Because um, as they range further ahead, they're going to draw fire. So I think, I think my problem was I didn't um, build the army enough around the idea of a dead cavalry charge. Hello. You see a tail wandering past the screen. Right, so I'm not going through the um, endless spells. So the pitched battle profiles. Um, call outs, I suppose. The black coach is 335 points. <clears throat> Lady Ollander is 340. Nothing else particularly jumps out at me. Uh, the Dread Scythe Harridans are battle line in a Quicksilver Dead Army, as you might expect. Um, now here's interesting. The Craven Throne Guard are battle line if Kurdos Valentian is part of your army. He does not have to be the general. Now they were his hired thugs who went round and offed people for him. Um, so I like that. I like that. Blade Ghost Revenant to battle line the Scarlet Doom Army. The Briar Queen and the Thorns of the Briar Queen are now 280 points. That's a lot. Feels like a lot. So none of the other sub factions change the battle line options. Battle line, as before, you've got Chain Rasps, Grim Ghast Reapers, Hex Wraiths, and Spirit Hosts. I think. I get the hex race a little bit more now because I I was at Warhammer World earlier in the week and there's a fantastic diorama and there's this sort of necropolis um, underworld gloom cave type thing and there's a road coming out of it and along the road they've just got black coaches and hex race with characters. It's a, it's a massive cavalry charge and I thought, yeah, okay. I was thinking of them more as a unit in their own right rather than actually their battle line. You could build an army around that. You could build a concept around that with sort of 10, 15, 20 hex rates and the associated characters and a black coach. And So it's on the list. Although I did swear blind I would never build and paint another one after the last time. But I think that was the way I was doing them. Anyway, I digress. Uh, and there we are that's the end of the book and the end of the review I hope you found it useful uh, a couple of quick shout outs thank you to my channel members and my patrons for my ongoing support in helping to work towards the hobby dream you guys are awesome it is very very much appreciated by me um, if you want to support me or if you want and or if you want extra say high poor content battle reports vlogs painting videos Check out channel memberships. Level 2 channel memberships get you access to the exclusive uh, members videos. Um, if you're like me, you're about to rush out and get a whole load of Night Horde stuff. Uh, if you want to support me, consider going to Element Games. I have an affiliate link with Element in the description of the video. And I get commission when you click on that to go to their store. Because they really like me. Well, that I said business their way. So, yeah. Uh, and on that happy note, um, we are going to leave that there, and I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.